Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to see you all um, for our network collaborative class on civic engagement and social action. My name is Jonathan Becker. I'm speaking to you from the American University of Central Asia. Um, although I'm based in the course at Bard College with Aaron Kanan and Brian Mateo. Um, we're really fortunate tonight um, to have uh, three wonderful uh, guest speakers. Um, but first, I want to mention that Gather Today are classes from eight institutions, Al-Quds Bard, American University of Bulgaria, American University of Central Asia, Bard Annandale, Bard College Berlin, Brock University in Bangladesh, Central European University and European Humanities University. And in the Bard class, we also have students from the American University of Afghanistan, American University of, Bul uh, of Beirut, Fulbright University of Vietnam, Tuskegee University in Alabama, UHELP in Haiti or University of Kiskea, and from our refugee in Kenya. So it's my great pleasure to bring a panel together of three relatively young, uh, amazing people who are models of civic engagement to share with you their ex our experiences. Um, our three speakers are, are as follows, and I'm going to ask people to make sure they mute themselves, please. Um, Snali Mustafa is CEO of Asylum Access, uh, where she leads the organization's work to dismantle decades of colonialism, fight for self-representation, and build intersectional coalitions to demand human rights for all forcibly displaced people. Sana herself is forcibly displaced, and most importantly, she's a graduate of Bard College. Corvi Rakshand is founder and CEO of Jago Foundation, which he founded with a group of young students. Jago's vision is to eliminate poverty through education. Today, Jago Foundation supports the education of over 4,500 children across 11 branches all over uh, Bangladesh. Finally, we have David Hogg, who's co-founder of March for Our Lives, and I believe he's a senior at Harvard right now, probably worrying about his senior thesis. Um, he's an advocate to uh, uh, end gun violence following the Parkland tra tragedy. His mission is to increase voter participation, civic engagement, and activism, covering a wide range of issues. And he's particularly interested in youth, uh, youth political participation. We have two moderators today. Um, in addition to me, we have Myat Mo Jue, who's a freshman at Parami University of Myanmar. She has experience in a variety of civic initiatives revolving around women empowerment, youth leadership, and advocacy. We also have Fardin Rahman, who's a second year mathematics student from Brock University in Bangladesh with a strong passion for history and political philosophy. He's actively volunteered for poverty relief programs and explored sustainable development initiatives. As part of the civic engagement course, he's designing a project initiative to support the mental well being of sex workers in his community. Um, Without further ado, we're gonna to go to our moderators, um, uh, Miat and Fardin. Um, what we're gonna do is begin a round of general questions for our panelists, then a couple of specific questions. And then if you in the audience have questions, you could ideally post them directly to me, Jonathan Becker, so that I could raise them, or you could put them in the chat. All right, so why don't, without further ado, we begin, and we're gonna to go to Miat who will uh, lead us off. Okay, thank you, Professor. So hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, who are joining us today from different parts of the world. And my name is Viet, and I'm from Parami University. So it's my great honor, and I'm very excited to be one of the moderators for tonight's panel discussions with our inspiring and very dynamic young civil leaders. So I am very excited, as much as excited as you, and then get ready to hear different stories and challenges, what has been in store from our amazing panelists. So um, before this, I want to pass to Fadin to introduce yourself a little bit. Hello, everyone. Good evening, as it is evening in my time. I hope you're all doing well. And you know, we're going to start in a few minutes with a round of questionings, I hope everyone is uh, doesn't get bored and enjoys themselves. So this we hope this will be a very productive session for all involved and we are really really grateful that our three esteemed speakers came to uh, came to this meeting here today to grace us with their presence and to give us certain insights into how they started and how it's going what are their plans for the future. Hope everyone has a good time. 
Okay, thank you Freddie, for the introduction. So uh, let me kick this off with the very first questions. So I would like to start from Meg Stanner, who is the CEO of Asylum SX. So please in five minutes, uh, tell us about who you are and uh, the nature of your work and how you got motivation to start working on your civic interests. Thank you, Mayat, and um, hello everyone everywhere in the world. Thanks for Jonathan, Aaron, and uh, um, at Bard for bringing me again. And uh, I want to welcome also my godmother is here who I am at Bard, definitely. <laughs> so good to see you. She's a big supporter of Bard and of me. So I think, you know, I'm here because of so many people. So let's acknowledge that first uh, and Bard as an institution. So I'm very grateful to all of you. Um, and I'm really glad to be back to have this conversation with, um, you know, other remarkable people, all of you. I'm, I know like everyone at Bard is someone who's doing something important and will be doing something even more important in the future. So um, I hope, you know, you feel like as peer uh, as much as I feel with all of you. And with that, I, I mean, the question of who I am, <laughs> uh, it's a, you know, it's a complicated question. We can go about it in many ways, but I guess for the purpose of this conversation, um, I am someone who was, um, you know, born in, and raised in a very political family um, in Syria. And that was, um, you know, I spent, I was born and raised all my life there until I was 22. Uh, I had never left before. And, you know, we've been living under, um, we still in Syria, no, I'm still under living under a dictatorship of the Assad regime and um, really grew up. It's very interesting is like the private space was a different experience than the public space for me. So within my family, as a very political family within the private space, we were discussing all different matters. In, in it, you know, I was a few years old when I still like being aware of like not being able to talk about things and my dad be, being very private when his friends come over for political discussions and like we disconnect the phone and you know everything is like walls will you know have ears and so it was really just natural to understand that we're living in a dictatorship it wasn't like an indoctrination in the sense of like sit and I will tell you it was just observing that my own existence and my family's existence. And of course, that also led to the, lots of discussions within the family um, by my father and my mother and their friends, group of friends, as again, in the private space about, you know, the different issues that we were living and experiencing in Syria and in the region in large. Um, and so that really helped in, in, you know, planted seeds to my political awareness and constant examination of um, really who I am, where I am, my, and my environment. And that being said, before even the revolution in 2008, my father was detained by the Assad regime for the first time for his political opinions. And I was at the time 15 years old and um, and it was really a very, um, it was a very fundamental experience that my dad was taken in a way, the way he was taken, like he would be taken by an authoritarian regime and just going disappearing for two months. Um, and coming back and really not talking a lot about what happened. And we had read lots of books and stories from the, those of my dad's friends as well about what happens in Assad's prisons. And it really, no one talks about it. And again, he came back and didn't talk about it, but it affected us as a family a lot. And when the revolution happened in the Arab Spring in general and started reaching Syria, it wasn't a question that we were going not only to participate, but to lead in the protest and really taking over the streets. Um, and we knew we we're putting so much at stake, you know, our own lives to start with. Um, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, we, I was detained myself by the Assad regime, my sister too, my father for the second time. And then, you know, we got to experience some of what we were reading about myself in terms of like what happens within those institutions, those places that far away, no one knows they even exist, you know, the detention centers. And so after being uh, released, it, we were even more determined that this is exactly the right fight. Like it's not now anymore about what we read about and about the stories that are being told and the realities that we lived outside of those detention centers. It's about our own experience as well. So we continued our commitment as a family for this fight, for the revolution. And, you know, the, one of the many things that uh, as we experience as being in the U.S. is like just people do not refer to that situation back home in any understanding that at the beginning it was a people revolution. And, you know, continuing to frame it until now as a civil war, which, you know, we can talk about how problematic this framing is and why it's not accurate to the realities right now. But, you know, in any case, after, after being released and continuing our commitment, again in 2013, two years into the revolution, my father was forcibly disappeared 
this for the third time by the Assad regime. And at the time, I had just left Syria to come to the US for a six weeks program, um, exchange program with the State Department. And I was supposed to be back home in six weeks. And it's been 10 years. It's going to be 10 years this June. And so for me, it was when I came here and I, on top of all the oppression that we've experienced in Syria and all the different traumatic events and living under a dictatorship and all of that, coming here was another shock for me in terms of the different injustices, the systems that really also oppressive systems here. And I started experiencing it. And, you know, first, this is when I became a person forcibly uh, displaced by the Assad regime. I suddenly found myself without a home, without a country, without a father, without a family, without resources, without documents, without anything. And so it was really, you know, organic for me to wanting to change that it wasn't like i decided to, you know i looked at causes and i decided to work on refugee rights it was just you know major to my existence and it continues to be and to my family's existence and it really to the foundation of the values that i believe in that everyone should have access to human rights regardless of their status regardless of race gender sex and all of that and so coming into this country and and you know founding myself and with this new personal experience and then also finding the different systems of oppression here and racism and classism and just the limited access to resources it was for me just i was like oh okay so my fight is intersectional my fight is not did not end in Syria. My fight to demand access for rights and really dismantling those systems of oppression started in, Th in Syria and it's continued until today. Thank you, Sana, for sharing the very unique stories of you. Um, rather than just like giving up like in against the, that kind of situation that has happened to you, you try to face it, face it and try to overcome the situation and be the light rather than giving that and losing hope. And that really, really inspiring for other people. And especially a lot of participants here who want to make a difference and turn the traumatic experience into the power of chain. And thank you very much. And I would like to pass to um, the Co uh, Mr. Covey and the CEO of Jago Foundation and to the same questions like who you are and how did you start your civic interest uh, particularly? Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, first of all, it's always good to be connected to young people, to talk to young people, to get their views. And Sana, thank you so much for doing what you are doing. Uh, my name is Kolbi Raksan. I am from Bangladesh. Um, my journey started in a different way. Um, I used to do charity work when I was in school, but giving out money to some families, uh, raising money in the school, and I used to give out. After doing it for some time, I realized that even with my honest intention, I was actually making other people lazy because I was just giving them money. So I wanted to do something that is more sustainable. And I did not know. I grew up in Dhaka, which is the capital, and which is very different than the other parts of Bangladesh. When you go to the rural parts, it's different. So I just wanted to explore a bit. I went outside. I saw some kids playing beside a garbage can, played with them the whole day. Uh, I explain. Uh, I when I asked them, "Will you play with me?" and they said they, they actually work. So I just wanted to know about their life. Uh, so we had a fun day. When I was coming back, the seven-year-old girl she grabbed my hand and she said, "Sir, I don't have a place to go. Will you take me with you?" And her second question was, "I don't have a family. Will you be my father?" So I was 21 years old at that time, and I did not have the guts that day to bring that girl home. Because what will my parents say? Where will I keep her? What will I, where will I send her for education? But that guilt actually turned it into an energy. I came back, I told my friends that if we want to do something, it has to be for the children because I was young at that time. So another young person probably won't listen to me and forget about the old people. So we, our only option was children. So we started the movement with children but when we went on the street with children's rights, because 20th November is International Children's Day, and this, is, this was never celebrated in Bangladesh. So we thought, can we celebrate it to let people know about children's rights? When we did that, how we did was we took all the street children of the street and we replaced them with the spoiled brats, which means the rich kids. And it was such a noise in the whole country, what is happening? But that's when I got to meet so many amazing young people who also want to do 
beyond just children's education. And it became a platform for young people. So today we have around 50,000 young people in Bangladesh, in every district in Bangladesh, working on the different SDGs. So that's how our movement started. And I look forward to uh, more questions. Thank you. Miat, you're muted. Uh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Covey, for sharing a very interesting story. And that's really, really interesting. You made a really, really good point of like how you really interact uh, with the beneficiary that you want to work with rather than just like doing something without really analyzing things. And that's really uh, amazing. Uh, so I let the last but not least, I would like to turn into uh, Mr. David. Uh, who is the co-founder of Mesh for Our Lives and with the same question, like who you are, what you got motivation to get involved in your specific civic interests? Yeah, well, um, I don't know how I'm supposed to follow up the people that went before me, but um, I, who am I? I would say that I'm a big brother. Um, the reason why I got involved is because um, on February 14th of 2018, my sister, um and i were both in a school shooting in parkland florida where 34 students were shot and 17 34 students and staff members were shot and 17 of them were killed um in one of the largest school shootings in american history uh when i was in my classroom when i was 17 years old um i interviewed my classmates having experience in tv production and speech and debate um knowing that we might not make it out alive and i hope that if we didn't that if if we didn't, our voices would be able to carry on uh, on what we thought about gun violence. Because too often after instances of gun violence in the United States, uh, the gun lobby and gun companies say, you can't talk about this. It's too political. You're politicizing tragedy. And I figured if we died in our classroom talking about why we need stronger gun laws, there would be no way that the NRA uh, and the gun lobby could say that you're politicizing this when the very kids who died in the shooting uh, we're, we're saying that we wanted to see change come from this. Thankfully, I made it out that day, but again, 17 of my classmates and teachers did not. Um, what really motivated me to start speaking out was after I got home from school that day. Um, and, you know, I, I just had to hear the unconscionable cries that I'm sure far too many of us have heard some different version of on this call, um, given the unfortunate amount of trauma and suffering that many people who are on this Zoom I've gone through. Um, it was the first time that there was something that I couldn't do to help my little sister. And I figured the only thing that I could do was go out and speak about what had happened that day and talk about why it needed to stop and why young people shouldn't be going through daily acts of gun violence and school shootings. So that's what I did. My friends and I organized one of the largest protests in American history of youth um, with nearly a million people marching with us in Washington, DC and 800 marches around the world. We had millions of young people walk out of their schools uh, across the United States in protest of gun violence. We registered over 50,000 young people to vote in 2018. We did a bus tour across the country to places where young people had historically turned out at a low level. Um, but if we could increase the youth voter turnout, we could defeat NRA-backed politicians. Um, and from that, we defeated more NRA-backed politicians than ever before. We've also now passed, we just passed our five-year anniversary on the 24th. Um, we've now passed, played an integral role in helping pass over 250 gun laws since the Parkland shooting. Uh, of course, we weren't on the forefront of each and every one of those because we aren't a the only organization in the movement. But we played a big part of that in helping bring resurgence to a movement that already existed before us by infusing a lot more um, young people into it. And... Uh, now I'm in my fourth year at Harvard. Um, I will be graduating at the end of this year, and I look forward to continue, continuing to mobilize to get young people involved in politics, like uh, our first national organizing director, Maxwell Frost, who now is the youngest member of Congress at the age of 26, and continuing to get more people like that in Congress and state legislatures around the country, uh, and put in the good work of how we address how somebody gets a gun by addressing gun laws, obviously, but also address why young people in many communities that don't get the attention that Parkland got 
um, feel the need to pick up a gun in the first place by addressing, you know, poverty and different aspects of systemic racism and other things that play into why um, the communities that are most impacted by gun violence are also the communities that face the highest levels of inequality and injustice. Thank you for sharing, Mr. David. And it must have been a, a very traumatic experience for you. But even though with Nax in all of these traumatic experiences, you really want you really like set up and work for the people who, and then you want them not to experience the same kind of tra tragedy again. And that was really that has been really really inspiring. So um, for 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 my part, that 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 is the end of the first general question. So I would like to pass the floor to. Uh, my co fellow students, uh, Fardin, to continue moderating this, this discussion. Are you ready, Fardin? Hi. I'm ready. Thank you very much, Miab. And it was really powerful hearing your stories, your origins, how all three of you came from very different backgrounds, but continue this fight for justice, for human rights, for policy changes, for systemic changes to what is undeniably oppression. We are all oppressed in different ways. And it's, and it's very inspiring to hear from all of these young, civically engaged role models. And so this uh, first round of questioning was for you to talk about your origins, the nature of your work. For now, I'd like to ask a different question to all three of you, starting with Ms. Sana Ali Mustafa of Asylum Access. And the question is that, what are your what are some of your biggest successes and challenges and how do you stay motivated when you face these challenges please thank you for the question and please call me sana um my biggest success is i think being here today my existence and the way i exist that in fact not only survived but i hope that i'm like thriving and contributing um to changing the world in many ways. I think that's in itself is for me is a huge success to acknowledge for myself because it really has been difficult and it continues to be. And I think it will, will, will always be very difficult. And I think considering the different very personal events that I've experienced that really cause big traumas and losses and griefs and all of that, I think the fact that I, yeah that I'm here um, in the way I am, um, it's my biggest success, I would say. And then um, I would say in terms of like the challenges, you know, that in itself is a challenge as well, continuing to be able to show up and really continue this work and continue to exist in the way that I like to exist, where I'm, you know, constantly examining who I am and the way I show up to my friends, to my community, to the country that I live in, the way I show up, you know, for the causes that I believe in, and really co continuing to reflect internally about my privileges and, uh, you know, my shortcomings and my learnings and all of that. For me, like, that's a success and a challenge. And um, I just hope that I continue to learn and I continue to be open with my heart and my mind to, to grow. And I think, to be honest, like this is one of the major things that I acquired from BARD, the critical thinking and the examination skills and toolkit. Um, I, I, for, for someone like me, I think BARD was really a perfect environment for that, uh, to really provide me with like this foundational mind philosophy of existence where like you're constantly questioning and constantly thinking and you don't take anything for the face value, you have to understand more about it. And I think this is one of the major skills that I hope to continue to you know build because I think if I'm doing that, then that means I'm not being close-minded, I'm constantly growing, I'm constantly learning. And I, in terms of like, why what motivates me and my passion i think for me is community i can just i mean period i would never be here without the people around me and the communities that i build um in different ways and in different enough in my work and in my personal life life i mean it really hard without people around you and not not anyone like people who really you share values with and i think building communities with that with shared values for me has been the foundation to go through all of this and to grow and to be challenged um, and to, to, to succeed as well. Uh, thank you very much for your response. Uh, it's, it's a very powerful notion, isn't it? The community of shared values. It's a, it's a very profound, profound feeling to be able to be something part of that. And I'm glad that you're propagating these ideas, these values, these notions. And it is such a beautiful thing to see this in the world, more of this in the world. And 
With that, I would like to ask the same question to Mr. Corby Rakshan of Jago Foundation from one Hakaya to another. Uh, Mr. Rakshan, if you will please, what are some of your biggest successes and challenges and how do you stay motivated when you face these challenges? Thank you, Pardeen. Um, so I still remember the first day when I started uh, this, not even a school, it was a place where we used to teach English to the children. I asked them, what do you want to do when you grow up? So one of these boys said, I want to become a rickshaw puller. Another boy said, I want to become a CNG driver, the tuk-tuk. And their biggest dream was a driver of a yellow cab because that was their horizon. And people used to laugh at us because we were teaching them English. Everyone was like, why not Bangla? We wanted them to become global citizens. Today, it's, it's been 16 years that we have been doing it. And our biggest success is that boy from the slum is now studying in the United States with full scholarship in United World College. So that's the success of that boy who wanted to become a rickshaw puller is studying engineering there. That, that's what we, we want to do. That's what the power of quality of education. When I started, if you say struggle, problem, my biggest struggle was my surrounding. Starting from my parents to my friends, no one believed in what we were supposed to do because I was 21 years at that time. So my parents actually gave me a condition of whether their business or my madness, and I had to leave home. I stayed in the slum for nine years to prove myself that we can do something. And yes, today, Jago, only in the Jago schools, we have 4,500 children, but it became an example in Bangladesh how quality education can change the lives of, doesn't matter what your background is. There's 50,000 volunteers who are working on their own. They decide what they want to do. It became a platform, it became a voice. The government is listening to us, that's, that's success. So for us, I think uh, these are the successes. And as I say, challenge is the first challenge to fight with yourself. Financial challenge, other challenges will always be there. You have to be innovative and come up with solutions. But fighting with yourself, believing in yourself, with your family, with your close one, my friends stopped picking up my phone because I started doing charity work. So they thought I probably I will ask money for them. So, so that, that was hard, but also at the same time, that success and motivation is these kids. This one girl graduated and she became a teacher. She came back to Jago as a teacher and now she's giving back to her community. That's motivation. That's changing rather than number. I think quality is the most important thing at Jago for me, for us. That at least if we can change one person's life in this world, that is success. Thank you for that. Thank you so very much, Mr. Rakshan. I like your philosophy on this, with the, the philosophy of dreams, of expansion, of the story of that children who were products of Jago eventually came back to help the foundation go. And I think this is uh, something that a lot of these students here are interested in, how did Jago expand so much, so fast, so much success in such a short time. And you have truly proven that education is a very powerful tool and the motivation, if it is such a unique, such a, pure motivation, then I guess the challenges, it is, it is something that you will overcome with a very strong character as you have shown over all these years. Thank you very much. And again, last but not least, I would like to ask the same question to Mr. David Hogg of March for Our Lives. And if you please take a few minutes to talk about your successes and challenges. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think some of our successes have obviously been the first one that comes to mind is that people said after the Parkland shooting that we have a, we have a Republican state legislature in Florida, the Republican House Senate and governor, and it's great that you all as young people care, but nothing's going to change, and we proved them wrong. Um, we did change gun laws in Florida. Uh, we and we raised the age to 21 to buy a gun in the state because um, previously the way that the shooter at my high school was able, the, the shooter at my high school was able to legally obtain an AR-15, which is modeled after the gun used in Vietnam. And that's still standard issue for many US military personnel, the M16. Um, and the only real difference between the two is that the M16 has a fully automatic function, whereas the civilian AR-15 
has only a semi-automatic function. Um, he was able to legally buy an AR-15 as a 19-year-old and threatened to shoot up my high school multiple times and still continue to own that gun. Uh, we passed two things specifically that I believe would have helped to prevent what happened from happening. Uh, one, we raised the age to 21 um, to buy a gun like an AR-15. And two, we also um, expand, we created a system, we passed a law called a red flag law that can enable you to disarm somebody that is a risk to themselves or others through a court order with a right to counsel and due process. And, and in, we actually ended up using that law um, for somebody that sent, that sent a death threat to my own mom that said F with the NRA and you'll be DOA. We used the law that we passed after Parkland uh, to disarm the individual that threatened to kill my own mother. And it may have helped, the, because of the law that we passed, it may have prevented me from having to bury my own mom. That law has now been used over 9,000 times in Florida. And granted, I can't say every single one of those times that it definitely was going to be a shooting that happened. I can't know the specifics of all of those, but I do. I, I think we can say with a certain amount of uh, confidence that at least a couple hundred, if not uh, several thousand of those, if a court ruled that somebody was too dangerous to have a gun, did prevent something awful from happening. Um, so I think that's one of our successes, along with, of course, all the other gun laws that we uh, have passed. I think one of the challenges that we've had, there are many, is one, how to not burn ourselves out because of our survivor's guilt. Um, and that's been a really, really big challenge. I think the way that we've learned to, I don't know if overcome, I don't know if that's something that you overcome rather than you just learn how to deal with. I think the way that we've learned to deal with it is a collective understanding that we're a community and uh, not just in, in, we're not just individuals in that, uh, you know, um, if I can't do this work, I know somebody like Jacqueline Corrin, who's one of the co-founders, um, can step up and do the work. Um, if I need to take a step back, it's not just on the kids in Parkland. There are thousands of survivors around the country that I've met and I know who have done this work for decades before me that are out there, especially people like Erica Ford in Jamaica, Queens in New York, um, who run a program called the uh, called Life Camp. It, that's part of the New York City Crisis Management System, which is a whole system that basically uses a public health based approach to stop kids from wanting to pick up a gun in the first place by helping to get the community the resources they need rather than just throwing more cops at a problem that is already, you know, happening in the first place and more cops is not going to solve. Um, it's basically knowing that, you know, it's not relying on any one of us. And if we need to step back, that's not selfish. It's, it's necessary. Um, because if we, if we as individuals are the, are the movement collectively and we're not taking care of ourselves and the movement's not taking care of itself. And I think the way that the other thing that has also been a really big challenge is knowing that, um, yeah, Jamaica Queens is a great place. You should check it out. Erica Ford's awesome. The program, once again, is called Life Camp. I just saw a comment in the comments that was talking about it. Anyways, um, the other challenge that we have is that the movement is twofold. It's that the movement to end gun violence has been historically very reactive. We're only able to mobilize after a mass shooting when in reality there are shootings happening every day in this country, hundreds of times a day. Um, Many of those individuals survive, but there are about 100 people every day that die uh, from gun-related instant gun-related deaths. Two thirds of those are suicides, and the rest are some combination of homicides and unintentional shootings. Um, the challenge with being reactive is that, counterintuitively to what many people believe, gun laws actually get weaker after there's a mass shooting in a state on average. And it's because when there's this huge outrage by the public, and we show up and we demand action. And then we go away as the media goes away or we lose interest, the NRA is still there and the gun lobby is still there showing up. And they're able, because they're so afraid of us, they're able to push these states to make gun laws weaker because our movement has not been able to sustain itself proactively. So what we've been working on just recently this week is for the first time at scale, March for Our Lives, uh, attempted to do a, uh, a proactive action at state legislatures around the country to show up before there's a shooting, to show up before the next Parkland or Uvalde or Sandy Hook or any other uh, shooting. Um, that's been one of the challenges. And the last one that I'll say is understanding that um, we can't just be, we can't just have anger and fear motivating us. We have to have anger and hope. And those are two really hard things to hold at the same time. Um, because we, we have to build a future. 
we have to illustrate to people what the future we want to build looks like. And that's done through artwork, that's done through oration, and that's done through different mediums of, of art, essentially. And it's fear that we're fighting against. The reason why many people are fighting against us is because they believe that we want to take all their guns away. And not only is that pretty much entirely constitutionally and legally impossible, it's also just logistically impossible. There are 400 million guns in this country. And I highly doubt that a government that, that can barely keep itself funded can take away 400 million guns, even if it wanted to. Uh, with that, we have to, it's about, in a weird way, it's about figuring out how to have fun, even as we're doing this work, to build community. Because if we're only surrounding ourselves in the wake of an awful tragedy, we'll, we will come to hate each other. Um, and what that looks like is this summer when I was in Uvalde, um, you know, a couple months after the shooting, when the parents asked me and other survivors to come down with March for Our Lives and talk to them, after we spent the day in this community talk, talking with parents who have gone through the most horrific thing that you can imagine happening, which is losing a child, and that's obviously heavy stuff, right? And what our step, what I, what we decided to do after that day, after marching around with the parents and having a rally with them and everything in their community, was, you know, I, I said to our staff, okay, this has been a really like exhausting and tiring day. We're gonna go and spend like an hour just way outside of town because they're in the middle of the desert in Texas, and we're just gonna go stargazing, and we're not gonna talk about gun violence or anything like that, and we're just gonna talk about the stars and what's going good in our lives. And as weird as that feels, given what we went through like that day and what we experienced, it's necessary. Because if we don't do things like that, if we aren't proactively learning to, to have fun and generate hope as we're doing this work, we'll never succeed. Because if just being sad and fearful and angry got us out of here, I would not be talking to you right now because this would have ended a long time ago. Thank you so much. Mr. David, for your very illustrative answer as to what the challenges that you face. And I've been reading articles about this for a long, long time about NRA's lobbying for, uh, well, this is very counterintuitive when a shooting does happen, they end up uh, making, I've seen claims being made that you should, uh, there should be more guns to stop the shootings. And uh, that does not make sense to, I guess, most people outside of the United States. But this is something that you've been fighting for a few years now and that the laws you've enacted the policy changes that you've made that they're helping people it's very very amazing to hear that that there is something that can be done it is not a lost cause and the fact that you have been fighting this that and at the same time you've been trying to having fun with it the same time you've been trying to build a community increase youth participation all these things are very important in the grander scheme of things and i really really do hope that soon within a few years that you will be able to achieve all of your goals and stop this madness that has been going on with gun violence in the United States. Thank you very much for your answer. And with that, I would like to uh, pass on the proverbial mic to Miat for the second round of questioning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fadine, and all the panelists who have answered the question uh, with a very great uh, explanation. So uh, so I also very, very glad that you all mentioned and you all have the common ground of that same spirit and energy, even though you're working in different sectors and different issues that you all believe in. Um, but with the perseverance and then uh, belief and resilience, and uh, it really shows us like how things can be possible even as a youth. And despite this uh, common ground, um, I believe that all of you will have like different strategies, how you are tackling the issues and what you are believing in. And so that the, the, the solution that you are dealing with might be different. So I wanna uh, start the question, the very individual question to each panelist. So I would like to invite uh, Sana first. So the question is like over the years, there have been several cases around Europe where refugees from the Arab world were have been accused of committing crimes at a high rate. For example, the 2050 New Year's Eve assault in Germany. So how do you convince a nation to welcome that forcibly displayed person in light of such stigmatization and possible security issues? Yeah, thank you. That's the question. Thank you for the question. Um, I think it's one of the, um, Unfortunately, when we talk about displacement and refugee crisis is like one of the main 
um, arguments and that really come up from the alt-right and like in a xenophobia, like the things around the two arguments around security and threat and uh, the economic um, burden of having refugees and migrants. And I think I wouldn't, um, you know, in my philosophy of work, it's not about convincing a nation to welcome while there's like a threat uh, that, that people have incidents as and then seen as threat. I think for me, it's always coming back into the roots of it, of why do even like why? I mean, the first, I mean, I think there are a number of issues. One of them is that that refugees have been painted in two contradictory images. They either terrorist or they amazing su successful people. And those two arguments and those two really media um, plans and propagandas don't leave room in the middle for refugees being humans. In humans, you know, you have someone who's successful, someone who's not, someone who's poor, someone who's rich, someone who's good, someone who's bad, someone in the middle. And so the fact that, you know, always we, ha we have to defend ourselves of being humans and being not, not homogeneous communities, like we are populations, we, like there is around 84 million refugees globally who come from all different backgrounds and, you know, different societies and cultures and all of that. And so if anyone did anything, it can't be representing the whole population. I mean, similarly, like, you know, goes to into other communities, right? If like, like talk about the US, like if someone, you know, when when domestic terrorism happens and, you know, when a white shooter goes and like kills everyone, should we just like eliminate white people by all mean, all of them, because like a white person did that. And the same like happens on a black people and, and other communities. And so the fact that even always there's two like extremes of painting people and especially minorities, and then they have to fit that image, I wouldn't convince, I would challenge and a question, and I would immediately try to understand where it comes from. And I think, especially on the issue of threat and painting refugees as a security threat, um, I recently published an article with the New Humanitarian about actually um, acknowledging the roots of where the definition of refugees and the Convention of Refugees uh, Rights that of 19, 1951 comes from. And during the research that I did on, on the convention, because I believe to understand the present, we have to understand the past. So to understand why refugees are seen as a security threat and to now and why racism in the sector, I have to understand where it comes from. And when I did that research and trying to understand where it comes from, I realized that during the convention, when nation states and members of the UN at the time came together to discuss how are we going to define a refugee, they spent a year and a half having discussions on defining refugees from and within Europe and refusing to, to make it a universal definition where like refugees from all around the world could become and acknowledge as refugees. And that's because they were painted as security threat and because of racism. That's the roots of how we define refugees today. That's literally the roots. And it took until um, 1967 until the definition has become universal. And at the time, who defined, who was members of the UN who defined this was colonizers. It was mainly global North countries. And because majority of the countries were still colonized by those countries. And so it took until decolonization and independence of so many of those countries. So the discussion got reversed in 1967. So that's the roots of our system. So I will like challenge and I will bring back exactly to where this definition has come from. From, and that, you know, trying to change that with like humanization of persons of first displacement. Thanks, Christina, for your response. And I really, really glad that you made a really clear point of rather than like convincing the nation to follow your lead. And it is a kind of like challenging how they have been thinking about those refugees and generalizing it as a like crime criminals and um, other like bad status. So, um, and then, and then you really made a good point on like when we are really making um, an issue and try to care about that, we we have I, I got a sense of we have to believe in what we are doing uh, before we are passing that motive to other people, and that's really really amazing. Yeah. So, um, Fadin, would you like to ask still Kofi? Yeah. Yes, I would. I would like to uh, ask a question to Mr. Corby Rakshan right now. And the question is: It's quite 
straightforward, but again, it's quite uh, valuable in the sense that in the face of the global economic recession, do you still believe that education is still the most effective tool to fight poverty or in your journey over all these years, have you discovered newer, more effective methods? Thank you, thank you, Kajin. This is this is a very debatable uh, topic. Different people have different perceptions. Some will say education is not important, but if you ask me, I will say that yes, education is one of the most uh, effective way of getting out of poverty, helping yourself. In this world right now, we also need other skills that's that's additional but we cannot eliminate uh, the basic education yes the way we are going you need skills you need other tibet education but there, there is no way possible that you can actually uh, get rid of education uh, from the base if, if you look at the story of, of jago how we were trying to help these children uh, I think the mindset of, of these children changed when they had the power of imagination, and that came through education. Uh, now, the question is, still, there's so many graduates who doesn't have job. That's a different topic because the education that we're giving in this world most probably are outdated. It's still those 70s and 80s education that we're giving when we're living in the era of AI. We, we cannot say internet. That, that's history. Now we're living in AI where you need to know how to run the AI. You need to learn how to use those prompts to get the best out of the AI. But even to imagine those prompts and very basic knowledge, you need that education. So I, I, I cannot uh, think about a world where you don't have access to education or where you don't uh, give, uh, where there's no schools. Uh, yeah, that's probably my, my straightforward answer. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. answer. And it's a, it's a very uh, clear and um, very convincing argument that education is uh, it's fundamental, right? You, can, you cannot do without it. And sure, you'll need additional skills here and now, but, but that, that one piece, that's, it's so big and it's so fundamental that you just you can't go without it. You just really need right. it. I'll so. just add one point that why we start this uh, conversation because we see that uh, so many people getting uh, they're graduating but still they're not in jobs. I think that's where we young people need to have a conversation with with the institutions, with the government. That what is the education that we are receiving? Can we update that? Can we uh, can we look? Can we do a survey of what is the need in the market and and the skills? Can we teach those skills? Still now, for example, in Bangladesh, okay, what have you studied? You have studied um, BBA business, but now people are becoming photographer, and and there will be new businesses where people will be selling courses to how to operate AI. Is there an education? Is, is there a subject where I can learn how to operate AI? But the world is making billions out of AI. So that's, I think, is more important rather than saying, is education important? Is education relevant? That's, I think, is the most debatable topic. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, little addition. It uh, obviously completes the answer and it, it does pose some very, very uh, deeper and more profound questions about what uh, the uh, educational institutions need to do when in charge of uh, making and designing curriculums. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to again pass the proverbial mic back to Miat for another question. Thank you, Ferdin. So this time I would like to invite Mr. David. Um, the question is about like, since you have been working on an issue, very important issue for like ending the gun violence, it has to be very associated with the people in power. So one approaching as civic engagement initiated, which is considered really, really political, how do you mitigate the differences in political ideologies of those involved and come up with the solution that appeals to the community, humanity of the people in power? And at the same time, when you are so repelled from politics uh, at the moment, how do you convince them that is really, really important? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it is it's a uh... It's a multifaceted approach. I think when we don't have any power like we did in 2018, 
um, in terms of having a Republican state legislature, our message and just what we were feeling was, you know, anger and just saying, screw all of you. We're not going to like, we need to ban assault weapons and do all this. And that's all like that's we're saying that and that's what we're going to get. And we're not going to ask for any less. And ultimately, we didn't end up being able to ban assault weapons. But because I think we put so much pressure on the state legislature in the immediate aftermath and the fact that our governor was running for Senate at the time, too, and what historically has been considered a swing state, um, we were able to pressure them to change gun laws because of the unique timing of the situation. Um, and, but after Uvalde, when, when we had a real chance to get something done at the federal level for the first time in 30 years, our focus was a lot less on just being angry and telling people that we, we need to have it our way or the highway. It was about consensus building and actually making anything happen at this point. Because I think for us, it was about proving that you could pass something at the federal level and not pay an electoral price for it. And in fact, it could be electorally beneficial to you to, to increase gun laws, to strengthen gun laws. Um, and that's what we did. Our emphasis after the Uvalde shooting, like my common line was that, you know, uh, I can respect those who don't agree with me, but I can't accept the fact that there's nothing that we can do about this. When even though we have policy differences on what we think should be done, we have shared principles here. You know, the ideals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We share those, right? Even if we have different ways of going about them. And we would be damned if we weren't to focus on what we can do to stop even one more shooting from happening when we have the the political uh courage to do that right now and the pressure to do that um and from that we were able to you know change gun laws there by really helping people grasp the enormity of the situation and how awful it was how many people were killed and how young they were and everything and help bring people together to change things. And I, from that, I started getting a lot of messages from people who historically have very strongly disagreed with me and said, you know, I don't agree with you on everything, but I do agree that we clearly need to do something here uh, to address this. And from that, we were able to pass gun laws. And granted, it wasn't as much as I would have liked, um, but it was still an increase at the federal level and not a single person that passed those that voted to support the Bipartisan State for Communities Act, which was the federal law that we passed in the wake of Uvalde in the first gun law in 30 years. Not a single person who voted for that lost their reelection specifically because they voted for that issue. If they lost, it was because of something else, like bad redistricting or something like that. Um, and then to answer the other thing that you brought up about like young people who were repelled from politics and convincing them that it's important. I think it's about using some, some we were uh, unintentionally, or I guess intentionally, but unknowingly utilizing a lot of um, tools that I've since learned about in behavioral economics, about uh, basically turning it, sticking it to the man, if you will, um, in 2018, it was about rebellion. It was about seeing vote, voting as a way of, of fighting against the status quo and changing things um, because people were obviously very upset with the election of Donald Trump, young people too, of course, and the fact that we were going through so many school shootings um, and daily acts of gun violence. And I think by making it that way, that by framing it as like they don't want you to vote, we were able to kind of use that psychology to help change their minds and turn voting into a cool thing. Now, the, the problem that we've really faced more recently that luckily I think we have been able to do is, is shifting from always being against something to talking about what we're for once that once we did gain power because we did vote at not only a higher level than really any generation at our age point ever has in American history not just in 2018 not just in 2020 but again in 2022 not just 50 50 either in 2020 it, sorry in the year 2000 18 to 29 year olds voted 50 50 for Bush and Gore in 2022, the average 18 to 29 year old for how much we were voting was plus 20 points for progressives. That shows that we're very clearly voting in one direction and it's not just canceling out our votes and we're voting at a higher level than ever before. So what we're focused on is showing young people, what have we gotten from voting? We've gotten the first gun law in 30 years. We've gotten the most climate spending ever in American history through the Inflation Reduction Act. And we've gotten a paradigm shift in American politics that has made it both younger and more responsive to the demands of everyday people, especially young people. Um, and that's how I think we've worked to convince them uh, why it's so important. It's about claiming our wins and showing what we've done 
And knowing that progress is takes a long time, but we are making progress. Thank you, Mr. David. And I, I'm really glad that you made a really clear point of like how young people, especially the like young people don't want to involve in those kind of stuff because they think that they cannot really make a change and their votings are not really affecting to make a difference. But you really show them the success stories of what has been done and what what can we really achieve together and what what is going to be looking forward for them to really engage in. And then and then that you really made a great point of like how you are engaging those people in power in a way that not really uh, disagree with them, but then you have a really clear standpoint and let them know that how white separate and how prevalent these kind of issues are. And I'm, I'm really, really glad that all of the panelists have different strategy, as I mentioned earlier. Um, in order to recap, like Senator already mentioned about how to challenge them rather than convincing. And that really takes a lot of patience and energy and the belief in uh, our issues. And then also uh, Mr. Covey, Already, already make that clear of like how an education can be relevant to any kind of situation and how the educators can think about to be relevant in the situation rather than teaching them um, in a very outdated way. So we have to be keep on the track and that's really, really amazing and inspiring. I think everyone can learn from can learn something new and something inspiring for them to make a difference. So uh, I think this is the end of the panel, but for the Q&A session, I would like to pass the floor to Professor Jonathan. Yeah, it's Professor. it's the end of, uh, thank you, Miad and Ferdinand. It's the end of your part of it. We have about 20 more minutes and I have some questions that people have posted already. So we're gonna try to go through some of them quickly. Um, and if you have more, please send them to me in the chat or you could post them in the chat. So the first question is for each of the panelists and it originates from Brock University students. And it, it is quite simply, what advice would you give to other young people like us who want to get involved in civic engagement and activism and make a difference in their communities. So what advice would you give young people who want to make a difference in their communities? Sana? Um, I think the first advice I would be, uh, or the major, I think, mindset and philosophy I would invite people to have starting this work and continuing it is um, self-examination. I think it's very important to understand who you are for this cause that you want to care for and do for things for it to change it. Why? And how can you show up in a way that's really about changing it and about empowering the people that you want to engage with and the communities versus like centering it about you. And I think that's a very difficult thing to do because a lot of the volunteering and civic engagement work, um, it's important to understand where it's coming from for us. And it's important to think about how we show up. And how can we show up in a way that's trauma informed, that's equitable, that's acknowledgeable of all the different things that we bring into the conversation and this cause also deals with. So I think just self reflection examination um, about who you are and your role and how you do it. Um, I would say this is, I hope, the foundation and the ground for um, engaging and changing the world around you. Thank you. Corby, how would your advice for uh, motivating young people? Thank you. Uh, first of all, to the young people, my first uh, focus will be, there is no shortcut in this world. If you are thinking of getting successful very, in a very short time, that probably high chances that it will fail. That's number one. Number two is uh, don't go with the hype. There are different hives that goes in the world and everyone starts doing the same thing. We have seen the phase of volunteerism, activism, startups. Try and see what you like. If needed, try different things. There's no harm in changing the topic, but try and see what's your passion. And if you want to go far, go together. One person can start something, but if you actually want to go and become successful, you need a team of people. So work in a group so that you're more stronger than yourself. I think these are the three things that I want young people to focus if they're thinking of starting a nonprofit organization or an activism platform. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corvey. David? I'm just rereading the question because I was typing up a response to the question in the chat. Um, what advice would I give to other young people that want to get involved in civic engagement and activism? 
make a difference in their communities. Um, I would say one, understand that the, the, the revolution is not going to come from a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, I know it's ironic for me to say that. It's just we March for Our Lives is a nonprofit because of the consequence of like our origin story. We had to take in millions of dollars of donations to fund a march on Washington. And we continue to use that money to help fund people to show up at state legislatures and stuff. But um, nonprofits are not going to fuel a revolution, especially when the people that are so ingrained in the status quo of society have co-opted these movements and a lot of these conversations at universities by funding them and basically using them to launder their reputations. I think a lot about like how like the Sackler family is heavily invested in Harvard University, the family that is one, I would argue, the largest drug cartel in US history that have killed thousands, tens of thousands, actually hundreds of thousands of people. Um, so I would say it's it's really about getting involved at the at the local level as much as possible. And if I could recommend a couple books, the first one would be this one, Politics is for Power. Um, it basically just it basically says the problem with American politics are people like me, white male college educated voters um, who are politically engaged in that they watch the news or go on Twitter and speak about politics as a hobby, but don't actually engage in their communities um, nearly as much because they mistake basically political hobbyism as actual civic engagement when actual civic engagement looks like working within your community on a clear set of goals whether it be something like bike lanes or registering more voters or doing running people for office um the other book that i'd recommend is called and i'll send these in the chat is called switch making change when change is hard um which is all about like a bunch of case studies and how and how change is made um and then I'm trying to think of what else. Oh, read the Persuaders by a, a, a non. I'll send his name in the chat. I'm I'm gonna butcher his last name if I try to pronounce it. But he's the guy that wrote Winners Take All, as well. Um, and I would I would also say just know that like all change comes from community. You need to you need to build community and friendship to have pers the persistence to get through the inevitable failures that are part of the journey to success. Because you can fail a million times and succeed once, but you ultimately do succeed if you just keep trying. It only takes one success to overcome a million failures a lot of the time because it's, it's part of activism. If we're not failing, we're not trying hard enough. We're trying to innovate enough in how we create these changes, in my view. Um, and it's about building up that persistence uh, to get through that and setting clear goals, too. I think all change comes down to basically project management, relationship building, and storytelling. If you get those three things down, uh, I think that we can change pretty much anything. It's just a matter of putting them in the right combination. And if you have the commitment and community and persistence to get through the challenges that come with creating change. I'll send the list of books in the in the chat. Thank you. I'm going to just do some individual questions now. So this is from Fallon uh, to Sana. Um, as a brown and queer Arab woman fighting for social change in a dominant straight white male civilization, do you have any empowerment affirmations that you tell yourself to remind yourself that you're worthy to take up space in certain environments? Um, affirmations. I think, not necessarily affirmation, I think my affirmations are what grounds me and um, to, especially to do this work and think what grounds me to do, to exist and the, the different identities that I hold that really affect my daily life. I, I mean, I it's important here to mention, you know, it's not about political identities. These are really experiences that shape my day to day. The moment I wake up and I exist and I leave my house, I am seen as one, two, three. And the moment I engage in certain ways, I'm seen three, two, four. And so I think it's important to highlight that this is not about just political identities. This is like existential to who we are and, the, and to our life. And, and death. it's life and death for many of us in different contexts as well. And in terms of like what grounds me to really be able to show up as much as possible, it's like my authentic self and to celebrate and love my, who I am and the different experiences that I hold in the society that we exist in that's trying to change. I'm, I'm always grounded in what other movements have done. I'm, I'm very grounded in the in the feminist, in the, I have to say, like brown and black feminist movements. Um, and one of my teachers, Audrey Lord, is someone is, is a writer, is a, is a poet, is a feminist thinker who talks a lot and talked and navigated a lot 
existence, her existence as a lesbian, black, feminist woman trying to really change in the 50s, the situation in the US, like it was way harder. And so she shares a lot. It was amazing for me to realize how much we share in common in different experiences. And it was affirming and grounding the fact that she has been able to change things. And so for me, being grounded in that, my ancestries in all across in all different movements and bringing that hope and learnings into the present is what really makes me feel my ability, my belief in myself and my belief in my communities and my ability to continue to show up the way I am. And um, and I think always it's worth mentioning that all different movements that I believe in grassroots, uh, you know, brown and black led movements and around indigenous, LGBT, black, all of it, they all grounded also in allyship. And I think that's really important to mention is that as we talk about centering the, the oppressed communities in leading and, and their, their fight, is we don't do it alone. We do it in allyship. And I think that's the, that's the invitation has been across movements to, to for examined allyship, an allyship that does not take power in the name of empowering, and an allyship that's really questioning how we show up and how we work together in community and recognize our different you know, backgrounds and, and, and experiences. And so I think it's important to mention that and to keep that in mind because people feel like, what does it mean for me? And I think this is one of the biggest question I receive you know, in my work now on refugee rights, I do what I do in my work right now. I fight for people rights, legal rights, human rights, and also the right to self-representation, which is the basic rights that refugees have been deprived from. And in this conversation, there's lots of fragility and vulnerability from people in the sector, in the humanitarian development sector around, well, what does it mean for me if you are leading this work? What is my role? How do I exist? And I think it's an important question because you know there's resistance. We're talking about shifting power, We're talking about changing how things have happened for decades. And it's a valid question because it's survival. It comes back to people's like really very much personal existence. And my answer is always not about excluding others. It's not about including others than excluding others. It's more about examination of how we can work together and how we can work in shared values together. And what does it mean then to be a true ally to all different movements that we're advocating for? Thanks so Thank much. Thank you so much. That was a very powerful answer. That's that's Fallon who posed the question. Thanks, Fallon. Um, so the next question is for Corvi. Um, Jago works closely with businesses, yet many of the students in our class are very skeptical of working with businesses, I would say. What are the benefits and dangers of NGOs working with businesses which have clear profit motives? Very interesting question. Um, so, so all the businesses definitely they have a motive. We have to understand uh, the nature of the businesses that is funding us and what is their motive. Most of them it, it's it's branding for them, and I don't see any harm uh, looking uh, taking money if it's about their branding. But is it an ethical organization? I think that is important. Are what are they selling? How are they maintaining their business? How are they paying their staff? I think those are important. It's not the business because the whole world, you will see that the uh, funding mechanism in the whole world is changing. Uh, the nonprofits are facing a hard time uh, getting money from the philanthropic organizations. So everyone is going after businesses, especially countries like Bangladesh, which is becoming a middle income country. Uh, the nonprofits are shrinking, the money is going to Africa and what do we do? So, we work closely with the businesses to make sure that we tell the businesses that if you're ethical, we will work with you guys. So, but, but we cannot say that we won't work with the businesses. It is very important to include them. When you leave them completely alone, they can do whatever they want. So it's also important that we are uh, having a conversation with them because at the end of the day, the young people and the people in the country are the citizens who are actually the customers also of those companies. So having those dialogues, I think is very important and including them. So definitely one third of Jago's funding is through the businesses uh, in Bangladesh and abroad. There's no harm taking those money. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a more narrow question for David, but this is from Kennedy um, who asked, do you ever feel nervous when publicly speaking out against former president Donald Trump, I guess, or anyone else? Um, 
What are you feeling in last year's uh, House Gun Control meeting? How did you find the word for your emotional interruption? Hello. Yes. Did I feel nervous? No. Um, I didn't. I just felt angry. I think there's a certain amount of anger that you feel that gets over any amount of nervousness or um, fear a lot of the time that you have that you like it's I, I think as the people on this panel have uh, kind of shown activism I, I activism in its truest form I don't think is voluntary I think it's for a community survival nobody is born and wants to be an activist activism is a consequence of a world existing that is quite flawed and imperfect and structures being in place where a lot of the things that we've gone through are not even flaws they're they're the parts of the system that are in place that we're trying to change. Um, so I think when, for me, it gets to a certain point, and of course this goes to the amount of privilege that I have, like obviously just being a guy, like if I speak out and I'm just angry and furious, it's like, wow, he he really knows what he's talking about. And like, he's so passionate and he's so well-spoken and courageous and everything. But I know too, that if I, if I was saying literally the same exact thing as a woman, that I would be written off as one expletive or another. Um, and obviously there's a lot of responsibility that comes with carrying that privilege in the first place and making sure that my female, female colleagues are also, you know, uplifted and spoken out for and or they're able to speak out and everything. Um, and then last year after the gun, the gun control meeting, I was really frustrated with Dems because in the house uh, they, they said, you know, if you pass it, if you get, if you help us get the votes for the assault weapons ban in the house, we'll pass it. And then we got the votes. And then we got put, sent on a wild goose case, uh, goose chase by House Democrats saying, oh, actually, it's this caucus that's the problem, or it's this committee that's the problem. And I literally spent basically two days going around Congress with a group of survivors from Newtown, from Parkland and other communities and saying, okay, are you, are you as ex caucus the problem? No, we're not the problem. We're going to vote for it. Oh, are you on this committee the problem? No, we're not the problem. And basically just calling them out on their BS and literally having to tweet about it and saying some not so nice things about Democrats. But to their credit, they did end up passing the assault, assault weapons ban in the House. And you might be asking, well, David, didn't you know that that was going to get sunk by you know the filibuster anyways, and it had basically zero chance of passing the Senate? I saw it as a chance for us to hold these Democrats accountable and show, especially young people, that when Dems are in power, they are doing all that they can to uh, to pass gun laws, right? That your vote does matter, even if it's not able to change things in the Senate, um, to show that even in the House, even if they didn't pass the assault weapons ban, that if they voted for this, they could still win their reelection. And nobody lost their election specifically because they voted for the assault weapons ban. Um, and then lastly, like when I found that, how did I find the word for my, um, my emotional interruption? Um, uh, it just came, it just came from my heart. I've always, I grew up in a household with a mom who's a teacher and a dad who's a really great storyteller. Um, and I think that having just grown up in that environment and also just, I, I often have struggled with writing throughout elementary and middle school and because of that I joined speech and debate because of my dyslexia and from that I really gained a knack for public speaking and uh, especially when I'm just really angry and I think hearing House Republicans talk about how you know I think the word that they kept saying over and over again was you know that there was a Hispanic invasion over and over again and that just made me absolutely livid because that's the same language that a lot of these mass shooters are using, like the one in El Paso that described, you know, Mexican Americans or people coming for, coming in from Central and South America into the United States as a, a Hispanic invasion. Um, you know, it's not like you're necessarily directly telling those people to go out and do those things. But if you're saying the same things as a mass shooter, even if you yourself are not telling them to go and commit those things, maybe you shouldn't be saying those things. Right. And that's why I said that, because I felt, you know, I, I think too often we think of ourselves as, as being ahead of history rather than in the middle of it. And whenever I've been studying history over the past four years, I always wonder, like, where were all the other people that were speaking out against X, Y or Z things or that should have been speaking out and weren't saying anything at the time? Why were there so few? 
And when I ask myself that, it's because whenever we look at ourselves, whenever we project ourselves onto the past and we think, what would we have done in these situations of injustice? All of us have a tendency to think that, yes, we would have stand up and we would have done something about it. But the reality is, and I hate to say this, the vast majority of us are just passers-by that just passively go along with life and accept the status quo as it is because things are hard to change. And I think what, cha what stops a lot of people from getting up and doing that and doing things like I did in Congress is, is the fact that it's futility. It's the idea that we can't change anything. It's one individual thinking that they can't change things that then leads to other individuals thinking that they can't change things. And I felt like it was important for me to speak out against the bigotry and racism that they were espousing that is antithetical to the principles laid out 250 years ago by some very flawed men. But nonetheless, I think those principles still resonate to this day of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the idea of, you know, e pluribus unum, out of many one, that's antithetical to the racism being spread by those members of Congress. So that's how I found those words, is I just got to, it's not like I wrote it out on my phone or anything beforehand. I just kept going until they pulled me out of the room. That's great. And I'm going to ask one final question. We'll go around quickly, which is from Yale, who says, how do you stay true to your moral compass in the midst of hard political decisions? How do you stay true to your moral compass in the midst of hard political decisions? Sana? I think I've, like, I think I spoke to that in many ways, but I, I guess in, in summary would be um, being grounded in my values, um, just and uh, understanding, and I think it's a good exercise. We all talk about values, and I think individually it's very important to do the exercise of like, actually, what are my values, and how do they also evolve and change? And so I think when I come into such difficult decisions or even conversations to had or like like decisions of accepting money who do you accept money from decision of engaging politically with different institution who do you engage with i think i come back into my values um and questioning that of like how i would feel living with that with myself and then i would also come back into the people around me the community that i trust as well that we have shared values to gut check this with them as well and you know decide then based on that how to engage um and i think one of the major things i tell all my team um, at the Salem Access all the time. It's a it's a very difficult, it's to unlearn, to unlearn uh, the fact that we have to say yes to all donors, for example. Like this is one of the most sensitive things that in the nonprofits we deal with. There is learned behavior to just say yes and accommodate. And we are gladly in a place where like all my team feel empowered to be like, this is does not align with our values. So we cannot pursue this with you anymore. And it's so hard to say that to money. But at the same time, we've noticed that the more we exercise that, the more donors with shared values have come our way and trusted us as well. Thank you. And I have to say, it's a special pleasure hearing Sana. She used to work in the Center for Civic Engagement as our student worker. So remember what you could become if you do that. Okay. Um, <laughs> Corby. I think it's, it's very... Uh important to understand uh, what you're trying to achieve. Uh, for example, for us, uh, we were a very activist organization. We used to always shout out about whatever is right and wrong. And then at one point, the political pressure came in a way that they're gonna ban our organization. They're gonna put us, they have already, a couple of our volunteers were arrested. And later on, when they couldn't stop us, they're like, let's close down all their schools. That's their weak point. So we had to make a choice. How do we do we put the lives of all these children that we have promised that we're going to give them education, or it's it's about creating that noise? Then later on we figured out that it's not always the best to be activists. Sometimes there are also other ways to sit on the table, talk to them. What they want is they don't want you to be arrogant in front of public, but if you're talking to them, so there are different mechanisms. Uh, you, you you cannot have one solution uh, for all the problems. So sometimes, yes, you have to raise your voice, you have to say no to them, but also there are times when you close the door and you talk to them in a nice way where they feel empowered and they feel that you're not against them to achieve your goals. That's something that we have learned. It's, it's not a straight no all the time. It's not a straight yes all the time. I think that's very important to find that balance when you're working. Thank you so much. And uh, David? 
Yeah, I mean, we have to think about this a lot in politics because there are strange bedfellows that we find a lot of the time. And unfortunately, we can't fight a battle on all fronts at the same time. We have to be selective in where we put our resources. Um, I think a couple of ways that we stay committed to those, to our moral compass is when, you know, if there's anything that liberals are good at, it's calling out people, um, perhaps to a fault at times. Um, so I know that if we ever do something truly, you know, wrong or anything like that, the worst, as the worst case scenario, people will call us out for it and have, you know, before, if there was even anything remotely questionable that we did that people didn't, didn't agree with. Um, I think what it comes back to is focusing back on whatever the mission is of your organization and realizing that don't mistake doing what's morally right as making everybody happy necessarily. There are going to be things that people disagree with, but ultimately you have to make a decision and focus on not does this make everyone happy, but does this advance the mission of the organization that you're setting out to do in the first place? And have you listened to people and taken into account what everybody said, but ultimately are you making a final decision so that you can move forward and make progress? And with that too, you know, unfortunately, I have to work with a lot of people that I vehemently do not agree with in politics, um, especially when we need 10 plus votes a lot of the time in the Senate to get through the filibuster. People who have said awful things in the past, done awful things, are incredibly corrupt and things like that. But I have to bite my tongue in those situations and realize that just because they are uh, bad moral characters, that if I can force them to do the right thing, if we can force them to do the right thing, that's still a good thing because ultimately it's those electoral outcomes and those those uh, legislative outcomes that matter to me the most, even if it's not, even if, you know, that vote is not by somebody who's a great person. Ultimately, I'm, I'm here to fo figure out how we can stop people from dying from gun related injuries and deaths. Um, and if that means me working with somebody who, you know, voted to in reduce taxes for the wealthy, that means that we may, we might just have to do that ultimately, because we can't fight a battle on all fronts. It's difficult. It's no easy decision. Well, look, this was an incredibly inspiring gathering and talks. I want to thank Miat and Fardin for their amazing uh, moderation. I want to thank my fellow faculty members, Omnis, Sabina, Madet, Aaron, Brian, Carrie, Hashmi, Samia, Chris, Flora, Natalia, and Ksenia. And I really want to uh, thank uh, Sana, Corvi, and David for giving us their time uh, and their wisdom. Um, we have more than 100 students here um, from across the globe who I'm sure have gained greatly um, in their aspirations to be civically engaged. And we're really thankful for your contributions today. It was a really inspiring and wonderful conversation. So thank you all for joining us. Um, for those of you who are uh, celebrating Ramadan, Ramadan Mubarak, I hope you've had a chance to eat um, and uh, or will later at some point. And uh, we'll continue with this network class. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.